Hello, Dr. McGrew. Hey, hi, Karen. So it's really great to have you here with us today. And I want to talk to our audience here and tell them who you are a little bit before we get started, because I know it's always hard to talk about yourself. So um, I see that you are a professor of philosophy at Western Michigan University, and you are a specialist in the theory of knowledge of logic, probability theory, and the history and philosophy of science. And uh, I'm, I've not been into apologetics or philosophy, but a couple of years ago, I started watching Jordan Peterson, and through that got interested in a number of academic areas that had not fascinated me at all before. Then I got into Paul Vanderclay watching him, and he has done quite a bit of discussing uh, John Verbeke's Awakening from the crisis of me from the meaning crisis. So I've I've heard a lot of this stuff thrown around now and have gotten more interested in it, trying to learn about it. And the big thing that I notice is that Paul Vanderclay talks about this idea of God number one and God number two. Um, that that there are people who believe that there is some. Uh, some way that we can hold on to the idea that there is a natural law and that there is such a thing as logic and rationality, but they have a very hard time of accepting an idea of God number two, who is a personal God who might intervene in the form of miracles or be personally involved in people's lives. And um, that may, may be a new distinction for you and in, in hearing people talk about that, I'm not sure, but. I, I know that you've done a lot on the rationality of belief in miracles. Mm -hmm. So I thought it might be interesting to have you give us the strong man version of, of uh, people who do not believe in miracles, who, people who believe that there's no way that um, given the universe that we have, that there could be any outside influence and then bring it around and tell us what you think about miracles. Does that sound? Sure. Logical. Yeah, let me back up for a minute and just uh, talk for a second about this God one, God two okay. terminology. The terminology is new, but the concept is actually uh, quite well known in the history of philosophy. And that's the concept of what is called a deistical God. Deism was a movement in, uh, it became very strong in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, to believe that there was some kind of higher power who had wound up the universe and set it in motion, so to speak, but that although there was this being, maybe even this being was morally good and worthy of worship, the one thing that this being would not do is found a religion, intervene in human affairs, leave the kind of trail that we find recorded in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. That's not the kind of deity he would be. In fact, well, so hold on just a second. I yeah. think though, when, when Paul Vanderclay is talking about God number one, or when many of these people who are um, people who have watched Jordan Peterson or who watched mm -hmm. John Verbeke, when they think about God number one, I think it's kind of a different thing. Okay. It's more the idea that that there may be some way that evolution has worked ah. to produce in humanity a okay. deep underlying knowledge that actually is working out towards some emerging higher consciousness or or higher understanding of a moral law a natural law not that there is necessarily a being who started the universe or has okay. any, had any power over how we got to be here that maybe we just came about strictly by um the the laws of physics and the Big Bang, and that's that. But that, that, but that we can trust in rationality. Uh, somehow. Somehow. Did yeah. we have any other I, questions? I, 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 yes, Lewis would say, if, if we just got here by random chance, then how can we possibly trust our thinking, right? But, right, so there, there is a very deep problem. So that's, that's sort of, uh, yeah, the, the, the hollow shell of of what even would be a deistic view, which is just to say, well, somehow uh, it's all maybe very mechanistic or very physically driven from the, from the physical side, and there's no other kind of causality that's fundamental, but somehow, lucky us, it all 
works out in some way that gives us meaning and flourishing and hope and, and all these great things that we really don't want to let go of. There is a, a term that I think Dan Dennett has used. Dennett, of course, is no friend of organized religion or of religion of any kind, but he talks about skyhooking things. And this, I think, is, is ethics and meaning on a skyhook. You've really, you've got a view of the world that makes it very difficult at best to see why there should be the kind of value that we ascribe to uh, ethics, to human moral choices. And then you have the value we do in fact ascribe to them, which is very great. And you know, there, there's kind of a problem here and you can't solve the problem by saying, but somehow it's okay. Somehow it's okay is not an explanation. It's not an argument. It's just the kind of vacuous assurance that we should be suspicious of, that we should, should leave us saying, you know, it looks like we just have a problem between our metaphysics and our morality. It looks like we've got a gap here. And that gap's gonna have to be plugged. And if you don't think you can plug it by sort of existential rah rah, we're going to make meaning out of nothing, then you're going to have to look at metaphysically richer views of reality. So now I see better where that distinction is going. The the deists at least had a you know some kind of ground for the universe, some kind of of being who produces it, even though he doesn't take a present interest mm -hmm. in things. But this kind of shell of that is really quite empty. And I think that that's deeply problematic. It's always interesting to see people try very hard, and some, sometimes very brilliant people try very hard to do the impossible. Uh, in mathematics, we talk about squaring the circle, which with a collapsible compass and an unmarked straight edge, uh, you, you can't produce a square that is the same uh, interior area as a given circle. But people keep on trying to do it. And for just decades upon decades, people would come up with, well, no, no, I have a proof. And then they'd be shown to be smuggling something in. And I think that what you have here is people trying to square the existential circle, trying well, I think to do the impossible here. A lot of them are using um, the, the new area of chaos theory and emergence mm -hmm. and ideas like that to say that there is, there is something that's more than the sum of its parts and that that can emerge. And um, yeah, I'm, I, you know, there's the assertion. Where's the argument? <laughs> uh, I, I teach, you know, chaotic uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. We talk about these uh, chaos theory complexity, but in the end, uh, chaos is a classical phenomenon. It's underwritten by the the laws of classical physics. You don't even have to go to quantum theory to get chaotic systems. And the trouble is, those systems can proceed deterministically. And all of the unexpectedness lies in our inability to calculate out ahead far enough to have enough degrees of precision in the way that we have our data points to be able to extrapolate without little rounding errors cropping up and, and making trouble for us. All well and good, butterfly flaps its wings, five months later there's a hurricane in Tokyo. We, you know, we can understand that kind of thing, we can give models of that, we can even do computer models of that. That's a very different thing from butterfly waps, rap, you know, flaps its wings and then you, you get a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like that, that's just not an emergent thing. And butterfly flaps its wings, molecules in motion bounce around, and mind emerges or value emerges. Those are yet a further step out. So when people talk about emergence, I think they're hoping that somehow we'll say, well, you know, we can't see this, but there are other things we can't predict too. So maybe this is just one of those things. Maybes are cheap and a more detailed story needs to be told. And, and so far, I don't think that, it's not even that I don't think anybody's told it. I don't think there's any hope of telling it. I don't think you even get to consciousness, much less to things like morals that require consciousness as a precondition. You can't have you know rocks being immoral; they just are. There's there's nothing that a rock can do that it's wrong. But okay, so in, in your thinking yeah. there, is that coming out of is that coming out of your um, out of your faith, or is that coming out of your study of the history of science and the philosophy of science? And it, it's coming out of the study of the philosophy of mind done by wholly secular atheist materialists like Colin McGinn 
who say the, the problem of consciousness is the hard problem. We are not going to solve this problem. We are not going to show how material entities and material processes give rise to consciousness, and we should stop pretending that we can. This is an atheist and a card-carrying physicalist saying it's not a solvable problem. I happen to agree with him for the kinds of reasons he uses. So this is in no sense something that is predicated upon my saying, well, since I think Christianity is true, I think it's not solvable. I could get there that route, but I actually think McGinn has just got it dead to rights. There are a lot of interesting things that we can do with uh, base nets, and, and there are interesting causal kinds of things that we can do, and we can solve certain kinds of problems. But getting consciousness and getting morals out of that, I think, is just so crashingly hopeless a project. We've had a couple thousand years to work on it, and it's not just that we haven't solved it. The further in we go, the worse it looks for the hope of getting any solution. So this is not a theological claim on my part. This, uh, here I'm just speaking as a philosopher, watching the philosophy of mind, seeing the kinds of hopeful things people try and how they crash and burn. I don't see that there is a viable project out there. And I think McGinn has a point when he says, we're, we're wasting our time. And we're it's, it, doing the kind of false advertising that can give philosophy a bad name if you say, oh, we can do this, right? It's like Elon Musk saying that he's ready to start people orbiting, you know, in his spaceships next year. Really? Come on. You know, you're, you're, you're just pushing it. And we can tell. So... So if Elon Musk has people orbiting next year, will you change your mind? <laughs> I'll change my mind about Elon Musk, but I have to tell you, I'm not holding my breath. If, if, if they get back to the ground alive, that's the other bit, okay? But uh, yeah, you know, uh, the, but people over-promising and under-delivering tend to sap their own credibility, and there's a long history of that in the philosophy of mind, and I think that if this has turned out to be a dead end. Okay, well, so let's go back to our project of strongmanning the, um, the atheist idea, or at least the non-theist idea, that, um, that there is no way to break the laws of physics, and therefore miracles are impossible. Well, here's a really funny thing. That kind of objection depends on the definition that you give of natural laws. So here, let me take a definition from the atheist philosopher J.L. Mackey, uh, who wrote a book called The Miracle of Theism, in which he tries to attack the rationality of belief in God. He's got a chapter right near the beginning on miracles, and in that chapter he says, the laws of nature are, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's, it's an accurate enough paraphrase, the laws of nature are generalizations that tell us how nature behaves when it is left to itself. Now, whether it is left to itself is a different question. And what will happen if it is not left to itself is a different question. So we study nature in ways where we're, we're attempting to discover how it works, assuming nobody else is monkeying with it. And we have some really interesting and advanced ideas about how nature works when it's left to itself. A miracle would, by definition, be an event in which the natural order is not left to itself. Something else is intervening. The natural order, to use the terminology we sometimes use in physics, would not be a closed, isolated system. Mm -hmm. And just as, you know, when a tennis ball is falling and then I catch it in my hand, we don't say, oh, well, uh, Newton's laws have been violated. No, instead we say, you, you put your hand in there and stopped it from dropping. Of course, that's why it didn't fall all the way to the ground. So when a miracle occurs, we would not say, well, uh, then you're saying the laws of physics are false. No, the laws of physics have this little exception clause built in. If the universe is being left alone, this is how it will behave. If it's not behaving that way, a fairly direct inference is it may be that it's not left alone. Or it could be that we got the law, even with its little if clause, 
wrong. But if the more we think that we got the law right, the more likely we are to think it's being intervened with. That's the guiding thought behind Mackey's own definition. Now, he doesn't think that miracles are credible, but his definition there leaves open the space for us at least to talk about what would it mean for there to be a miracle and what might it mean for there to be evidence for a miracle. So let's try to construct using the Scottish philosopher David Hume as an example. Let's try to construct an argument uh, for the incredibility of a miracle, not the impossibility quite, but the unbelievableness. And, and the argument goes something like this. At least when we're talking about what other people report, when we're not ourselves eyewitnesses of miracles, we are relying on testimony. And testimony is a source of a, a lot of what we know that we don't directly observe, but it's an uncertain source in two ways. People can get things wrong because they are just deceived. They think they're telling us the truth, but they're not. They got it wrong. They misidentified something. Or they can be deceiving us. They can know that they're saying false things. They could do it deliberately. Sadly, both of these phenomena are exhibited in our everyday life. We all know of cases where people have lied to us, and we all know of cases where people have been honestly mistaken. On the other hand, the very point of our calling certain things the laws of nature is that so far, we haven't found any exceptions to them. So if there's an arm wrestling contest going on between what the laws of nature tell you happens and what testimony tells you has happened at some point, then it can look like you, you've got sort of the 800 pound gorilla on the side of the laws of nature, right? This is, this is not gonna lose the arm wrestling contest. The laws of nature have been exhibited without exception in our experience. Truthful testimony is unfortunately a much less reliable thing. Sometimes we get truthful testimony, sometimes we don't. When we don't, it isn't even always deliberate. So you're pitting a stronger evidence against a weaker, and whenever you do that, you need to follow the balance of the evidence, and it's always gonna lean over to the stronger side. So you should always discount any account of a miracle, anyone saying that a miracle has occurred, and you should always go with the stuff that we've never found heretofore to have any exceptions. That, I think, is the intuition, broadly speaking, that underlies what Hume says in his famous essay of miracles. It's certainly the argument Mackey found persuasive, and it's sort of a staple of the atheist literature. Okay, so how do you get around that then? Well, there are a lot of problems with this, and I think that many of them were identified by Hume's own contemporaries. Here's one of them. A miracle is, by definition, an intervention in which nature as a system is not left isolated, in which something else, not nature, comes in and plays a role, makes things happen. If a miracle is to function as a sign, and that's what all religious miracles are supposed to do. There's signs that certify that this person's prophet or this person's message has divine warrant. Then there has to be a way for us to notice the sign. It has to break in upon a background of the way the world works when it's not interfered with so that we can see that it is an intervention, that it is some kind of interference. Suppose, for example, that one person in a thousand had the ability to turn water into wine. And we, get, we note this. We you know, do little studies and we find, yeah, it's just like a rare genetic aberration. A few people can just turn water into wine. Then we read John chapter 2 of Jesus turning water into wine. And what do we say? Oh, he was probably one of those people, right? No divine intervention required. No authentication of who he is, nothing, nothing of the sort. It's just a rare natural phenomenon. Then it's not a sign. It doesn't give us an endorsement of who Jesus is, of what his message is. It's just an oddity. That won't work as a sign. So if it's to function in a religious context as a sign, then it has to be the kind of thing 
that can't happen unless nature is not left to itself. But what this means is that it's part of the requirement for a miracle that there be a steady course of nature when nature is left to itself so that we can see the sign, so that we can see it as a sign. So the thing that Hume picks out and says is overwhelming evidence against a miracle, the laws of nature, we've never seen them to be violated in this way, is the very thing that's required before a miracle can fulfill its role as a religious sign. There's got to be a backdrop against which the miracle stands out as not the way nature behaves when left to itself. So the very fact he's picking up on turns out to be a prerequisite for a miracle and therefore cannot be evidence against it. There's a lot of analysis of Hume's original argument, some of it written by his contemporaries, and there's a, a contemporary still living philosopher of science who is agnostic. He's not a Christian. His name is John Ehrman. And uh, he, in the year 2000, came out with a book that really annoyed a lot of his fellow atheists and agnostics. It's called Hume's Abject Failure, The Argument Against Miracles. And you wonder, why would an agnostic philosopher of science write a book attacking Hume's attack on miracles? The answer is, the arguments that Hume gives, if we were really to take them to heart, would also block the path of scientific inquiry. We would not be able to do some of the things that we have done in the history of science that seem eminently reasonable, where we've got something unprecedented, but we go with it. We maybe have some testimonial evidence or some instruments give us some readings that we're not sure we understand, but we follow that out and we find more evidence and the evidence eventually overwhelms our up to that point, absolutely uniform experience. You can think of examples of these from the history of science. You know, starting a fire with a touch of a piece of ice. What was that? Imagine what the first people to notice that thought. Uh, taking an animal and cutting it up into multiple pieces and have, having every one of them regenerate into a, a complete organism of the original type. What? A, an object so massive that you literally can't see it. Welcome to black holes. Um, there are all kinds of unprecedented things that we've run across in science. And if we said, well, that's unprecedented, therefore no amount of argument could make us believe in it, we would have stalled science out over and over and over. So Ehrman says, this argument, if it worked, would prove too much. And therefore, it's really pernicious. And then he goes back and he spends about half of the book simply republishing things that Hume's own contemporaries said and pointing out that their grasp of non-deductive inference is actually better than Hume's own grasp of non-deductive inference. I have many more things to say, but I'll, I'll just give you that much, and then you can push it any way you want. Well, I was struck by one of the quotes on one of your, um, one of your lectures that I was listening to. You said, if you are wrong, how will you find out? Yeah, that's a very important question. I thought question. that was a great question, so I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Right. I think this is really a fundamental question, and it's a question everybody needs to ask. I don't get a get-out-of-jail-free pass for that because I'm a philosopher or because I'm a Christian. Everybody needs to ask this. If you are wrong, how will you find out? When should I change my mind? And one of the difficulties with the Humean position on miracles is that he has tried to, to work it out so that a miracle is defined as a thing that you could never believe. Hume is an empiricist. He doesn't think that you can rule out matters of fact just by sheer cogitation, a priori. You can't do that. So he can't just by pure mentation say miracles don't happen. But what he's trying to do is do an end run around that by saying miracles can't rise to the level of being credible. And the trouble is, he, now he's got something that could actually be true, and he's set up a kind of epistemic trap door, and he's inviting us to walk through it. Once we go through it, we can never go back, and the sign on the trap door says, you can never believe rationally that a miracle has occurred. So there you go, you walk through the trap door, now you're locked in a place where you cannot get out, and if you're wrong, you will not find out. That's a bad place to be. 
there is a wealth of literature in cognitive science that tells us we are prone not to take as seriously evidence against what we believe or even evidence against what we expect. And this kind of confirmation bias is everyone's problem. Nobody gets an exemption from it. It's a worry. It's not an impossibility. I don't want to exaggerate it. But if you take Hume's argument seriously on his terms, you are basically embracing confirmation bias with open arms and saying, I absolutely will not allow myself to be reasoned out of this position, no matter how much evidence there is. There is nothing that could change my mind. And that is a position which even some very bright people, some philosophers uh, who I think should know better, have overtly endorsed. They're, they're all in with David Hume, and they are definitely not going to change their minds no matter what happens. They'll go with any explanation. They'll go with aliens before they go with a divine intervention into the natural order. I mean, it, it just, it makes me think of that guy, you know, aliens, the guy with the big hair that everybody loves in the-, well, in the I meme. mean, that probably sounds ridiculous, but I well remember my daughter's seventh grade science textbook when I lived in Iowa. And in her science textbook, which had been sadly very much dumbed down because now that they don't teach, um, they don't teach reading properly. They have to dumb down all the textbooks. So here's this sad textbook, which was about half pictures. And, and uh, when it was talking about the origin of life, it, well, it could be this, it could be that, or it could be that it, it floated into our atmosphere on a cube of ice. That, oh, that's nice. Where did the cube of ice come from? <laughs> Yeah, and how did it get onto the cube of ice? And what a lucky thing that it just targeted us. And yeah. yeah and then it survived coming all the way. Yeah. Right. Directed panspermia. That was, that was her science textbook. But going Maybe. back to this question of how will I find out, it occurs to me that that is a much wider problem than just David Hume, because that's exactly what's happening on social media when the algorithms separate out what everybody sees so they only see what they want to see. And if what they're seeing, which is in their wheelhouse, it's what they're interested in, it's the only part that they want to believe, if they only ever see what they believe, how will they ever find out if they're wrong? And this is you know, why we have our political polarization, it's why um, people are unwilling to talk to each other anymore because they each have their own set of evidence. And their evidence is so, for them, is such a steel trap that they can't get out of it. Yeah, it's, it's really a profound problem. And I think there are some things that we can do to try to ameliorate the problem. Nothing is, is foolproof, nothing is perfect. So I cannot just give you a five-step program that will guarantee that you never suffer from confirmation bias. If I could do that, other people could do that, we would all like to think that we would buy into it. Um, but here are a couple of strategies that we can use to lessen that. Number one, read old books. Previous generations had their blind spots, just like our generation has its blind spots. But they're generally not the same blind spots that we have. So if I'm reading Augustine and Boethius, there are some clay feet that they may have. There are some mistakes they may be making, but I'm not likely to fall for their mistakes. And the mistakes I'm likely to fall into they're probably not going to fall into. And so reading them, I can get the perspective of somebody who doesn't have the problems I have seeing my own biases. Mm -hmm. So reading old books can be something that is useful to us. Uh, reading the books of the future, as C.S. Lewis once remarked, would do just as well. Unfortunately, we can't have them. So that's why we have to read the old ones. Another thing is try to find those rare, precious individuals who disagree with you, but are thoughtful, and articulate and actually want to change their minds if they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Because you can learn from a person like that. That person's probably going to disagree with you and let you know exactly where and why. And you can do the same. And if the person has goodwill and maybe even a sense of humor, these conversations can be enormously profitable. You can learn from it, they can learn from it, and it doesn't have to bog down 
in just screaming matches the way that most Facebook threads seem to explode when the wrong kinds of issues get put up on them. But it also doesn't uh, have to bog down in mutual incomprehension. People with goodwill really trying to understand one another and taking enough time can sometimes break through these barriers. I have seen this happen. It is rare, but when it happens, it's really rather precious. And so I actually had one guy uh, give me his claims about the Gospels at one point, and I said, okay, that's just not true. Let's go here and here and here. And I, I laid out passage after passage after passage. He's like, hang on, I'm going to go read this one. Okay, hang on, I'm going to read that one. Hang on, I'm, I'm looking up the third one now. And then he said, okay, you're right. I almost didn't know what to say. <laughs> like, wait, wait, you, you mean you, you changed your mind in response to evidence and reasons? Wait, this Diogenes, we found an honest man. What did we do? It, it, it was amazing. But there are a few people out there like that. And well, I'm not saying exactly all conversations will end that larger. well, but yeah, it's sorry. a larger ecosystem than you would imagine because that's exactly what I've discovered watching Paul Vanderclay's videos and interacting with the people that watch him mm -hmm. on the YouTube, um, on his YouTube videos and on on the uh, the whole ecosystem that's developed around that. Right. There's wonderful conversations going on amongst people who do not agree with each other and yet are are uh, enriching each other's lives in really remarkable ways. So. Right. Well, if there's anything out there on the internet that can act as the sort of filter for collecting those people in one place, then that is one of the best things that the internet has done. Yeah. It's done many wonderful things and it's done many absolutely terrible things, but this is definitely, this is a net gain. If we can pull those people together into one place where the noise from the other kind of people is lessened and we get you know more signal less noise then fantastic that's wonderful so maybe we could generalize out to this idea of uh, what everybody's talking about at least in the ecosystem that i've been watching on the meaning crisis okay. and and that um i know that the terminology is not new to John Pervakey, but he has been doing this series of videos called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And in that, he has laid out um, history of philosophy, the history of science. He's done a lot of work on cognitive science to um, illustrate that from his perspective, how we got here and, and mm -hmm. why we're here and um, trying to determine a path forward from this point. And he seems to be doing this with, uh, with really a good heart and a sincere desire to, to help people who have gotten trapped in the meaning crisis. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you could just lay out for me how you see the history of science. Um, that's, a, that's a big question. I know you can't lay out the whole history of science, but just just to the history of scientific thought that brought us to this place today where people feel that there is no way out of this question of um, the, the incredibility of God. Mm -hmm. So let's start way back uh, with some Greek thinkers before Socrates. There was a group of thinkers um, Democritus was one of them, uh, Epicurus, and then later Roman thinker summarized a lot of that, and that was Lucretius, and their view was called atomism. And you think, well, that sounds promising. We believe in atoms today, but the atomists of the Greek period not only believed that the only two things that there fundamentally were were atoms and empty space, uh, they went all in on this. They meant not just that there are physically, but that there are at all. The soul, if there is a soul, is composed of atoms and void. Uh, the gods are names that we give placeholders for causes of things that we don't understand. But if only we understood atoms and void, we would understand that's the total explanation. It is an early but very self-conscious form of scientism. It is the idea that we've got 
a total explanation for reality here in a few fundamental physical principles. Mm -hmm. You can understand their enthusiasm for the idea that there are invisible bits of matter and that that helps us to explain why clothes hung out on a line dry even though you don't see anything leaving the clothes and and the, the power of wind and things like this, the little molecules of air that you can't see individually are pushing on things. Okay, that's all good. But the bit where they say, and that's all there is to reality. Now that's a whole new level of reducing everything down to that. And that prompted a meaning crisis in Greek philosophy. Plato said that if he could gather together all of the works of Democritus, every single copy, he would burn them. He was that unhappy with it. And Plato, I need not stress, is, is, is not a Jewish or a Christian thinker. He predates the Christian era and is somebody who is simply doing this because he realizes that this view does not leave room for all the things that are most important, most valuable true principles, moral principles, mathematical principles. You can't find justice. You can't find courage in an atomic universe. It's just been defined out of the picture. So the idea that a phil philosophical position could be inadequate and it could provoke other people to look at it and say, you have just excised very important aspects of human life and thought from the universe, that's not gonna fly. That is not necessarily what we would think of as a religious response. And so the idea that this has all come about because we've abandoned you know, Aristotle or, or something like that, we, we need to look at the specifics, we need to look at exactly how this is worked out before we say anything that is too sweeping about the causes of a contemporary malaise. Let me just take Copernicus as an example. So Nicholas Copernicus died in 1543. I had a copy of his masterwork on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres uh, actually in his hands when he was on his deathbed. It had just been printed. And Copernicus' great contribution was to make a detailed argument that the earth was not in fact holding still at the center of the universe near the center of the solar system, but was in fact in orbit around the sun and so were the other planets. And that supposition enabled him to explain a great deal. Galileo came along, invented a telescope capable of giving us uh, reasonable images of the skies and vindicated the Copernican view, got in trouble for it, a certain amount of trouble. The idea that we're not at the center of the universe is not something that destabilizes our sense of who we are. That metaphor of the center as being the most important place is a modern metaphor. It's not the way that ancients and medievals thought about the structure of their universe. In the Ptolemaic and the Aristotelian universe, the one that Copernicus is coming along and offering an alternative model for, in that older view of the universe, the center of the universe is the garbage can of the universe. It's the bottom. It's where the things that are least permanent, least pure, aggregate and collect. And here we are down at the bottom, living on the surface of this tiny speck of a planet when the really perfect things are immense and they're so far away. And so being told, you know what, you're not at the center anymore, that's, that's not provoking a crisis of meaning. It changes our view of the cosmos. That's interesting, but people rolled with that. Galileo had no problem with that. Kepler had no problem with that. Kepler was not somebody undergoing a crisis of meaning. Kepler thought of himself very much as thinking God's thoughts after him. Newton was not undergoing a crisis of meaning. The crisis of meaning comes on when people pick up on the Newtonian revolution, the fact that Newton has given us a handful of physical laws and they explain so much about the workings of the universe when left to itself. And then they add to it that, and you know what? It really is always left to itself. Okay, 
now we have a problem. But the problem arises not because of the physical displacement of the Earth. It's becoming a satellite around the sun. The problem arises because you have just pulled the plug on the idea of an intelligent designing mind that has purpose and care for the universe. Many people who were absolutely happy to accept Newton's theories had no crisis of meaning whatsoever. You could think of people like Nathaniel Lardner and Samuel Chandler and John Leland and uh, just uh, Thomas Chalmers in the 19th century. These are not people who are resistant to science and these are not people who are suffering any kind of uncenteredness. They know exactly who they are. They know exactly what they are. They're following in the footsteps of people like Robert Boyle, Newton's friend, who endowed a whole series of lectures on the defense of Christianity because he thought it was so important. We study Boyle's law in junior high physical science classes now. We, we, we make use of vacuum pumps, which Boyle pioneered. These people didn't have a crisis of meaning. The crisis of meaning doesn't come with the advances in scientific knowledge. The crisis in meaning comes when you pull out of the equation the idea that there is something transcendent. And you say, no, it's all just nothing but. And then you, you, know, you fill in matter moving under Newtonian laws ceaselessly. That you're back in roughly the position of the Greek atomists. You've reduced it, you've flattened it out, you've taken meaning out of the picture, and just as Plato reacted to the atomists and said, whoa, this is totally wrong. So these Enlightenment Christian thinkers said, wait a minute, you don't have to do that. Why would you do that? You can have the science. The science is great. The science is grand. Well, how does it reveal the mind of the maker? And not have to have any kind of crisis of meaning. So when people say things like, oh, Copernicus, now he really threw us into a tailspin. No, he didn't. That, that's just a mistake. Understanding these things, I think, brought on maybe by the application of a modern metaphor of what the center is and how important the center is that had no place in the minds of the people Copernicus was supplanting. And so they, they either thought he was right or thought he was wrong, often on empirical grounds, rarely actually descending to the level of saying, oh, it's a matter of the interpretation of scripture. The first line of argument was, but his view is empirically inadequate because of this, that, and the other thing. Galileo comes along and cleans most of that up. Kepler helps. Newton puts it all together. But the arguments were empirical. They were not theological. Um, not, I, I say they were not theological. There were some passages of scripture that got brought in. Usually when they did, it was only after the empirical ones had already been brought up. And at best, they said, it's a tie. We can't tell. So we'll go with the simplest interpretation of scripture. But that's very different from you know, the, the idea of using theological dogma to pound down science. That's not the way that the history unfolded at all. Well, because so many of the great scientific um, discoveries were made by men who were very um, dedicated Christians, right? Absolutely. Wasn't Maxwell, wasn't Maxwell yes. uh, Maxwell's equations a dedicated Christian? Yeah, Clerk Maxwell and Faraday. Uh, on whose work Maxwell built was a Sandemanian, a very devoted Christian. Uh, yeah, Georges Lemaitre was a Catholic priest. Yeah, people, Gregor Mendel at the foundation of genetics was a monk. It, religious people have been working on science at all of these levels. My own friend, Andrew Pinsent at Oxford, he's got uh, a doctorate in philosophy from St. Louis University as a doctorate, I believe, in theology from the Pontifical Institute at Rome. And he has a doctorate in nuclear physics from Oxford. He's kind of a bright guy. He has no problem with reconciling religious belief and science. He thinks it's beautiful and wonderful. So uh, this whole idea that religion and science are in some kind of death match is something that was propagated by uh, People like Andrew Dixon White in his History of the Warfare of Science with Theology, he's pushed, he pushed a line. He was one of the people in on the founding of Cornell University, which was, I believe, the first public university on American soil that was not founded 
by a religious group or religious men for religious purposes. And he wanted to make it out that science and religion had always been at war. But this whole warfare model, ask any competent historian of science, does not matter what the historian's own personal religious views may be. You can ask Ron Numbers, who is not a Christian, and Ron will tell you, yeah, the whole warfare thing is just that. That's an urban legend. That's a myth. But it's a myth that has a hold on the minds of the people who produce, say, the reboot of Cosmos, right? They're well, uh, the they, people who've written the history books. I mean, I was sure. sort of taught all that, even in my history and what I was, and I, I go a long ways back. So it's been <laughs> in the history books for a long time. Yeah, and 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 so those of us who do the history of science are almost despairing, trying to you know run back down the the history of science and and find all of the cases where we've got George Washington's chopping down their father's cherry trees and saying no 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 this didn't happen stop stop it's not what it was at all and so it's it's really important before we try to draw large scale conclusions about what is going on from the history of science, we must first get that history right. And it's, it's a fascinating study. It's a wonderful thing. I am currently teaching a graduate seminar in the history and philosophy of science from the atomists through Galileo. That's the whole task this semester. Primary sources all along the way. It's wonderful. I can't wait to go in and teach tomorrow morning. But it is not at all a disorienting process from the standpoint of a crisis of meaning. There are disorientations, right? You know, you thought that the universe was centered and structured with concentric spheres, and now you find that it's not. Well, it takes a certain mental readjustment, but it's not going to make you question right and wrong, question whether there's well, such a thing as justice. Where, where do you think the crisis of meaning? Now, when I think of the crisis of meaning, what I'm thinking of is this issue of nihilism that has gripped the younger generation to such an extent that they don't see any purpose for getting up in the morning. Right. That, that's what, when I think of the crisis of meaning, I'm thinking of young people. I have a 25 year old daughter, so I'm thinking about her contemporaries mm -hmm. and, and the younger, even younger than that. And I'm going all the way up into their thirties of people who've just kind of given up any sense of transcendence, any sense of external meaning in their lives other than mm -hmm. just what their day-to-day -day life is and makes it very hard for them to go on. And, and so I'm wondering, where, where do you think that came from? What, what brought that about? I don't really think this is a mystery, right? They've abandoned the idea that there's anything transcendent. They still long for it. You'd have to be a monster not to hope and wish that there's something beyond our all dancing to the music of our DNA, but they've given that up. And the place that they gave it up usually was when they were on their way out the door of the last church or synagogue they ever visited. And they dropped it off on the way like farewell to all that, discovering that their smart professors were telling them, okay, this is the way it is. Not realizing that what their philosophers were giving them was not science, it was philosophy. That what their science professors were giving them when they said, of course, there's no meaning to life, wasn't a scientific pronouncement. It was bad philosophy. There is something in cognitive science called the halo effect where somebody uh, who is outstanding along one evaluative axis seems to be outstanding in others. So you get somebody really handsome as a spokesman for a product and people assume he must also really know what he's talking about because he's good looking, right? There's this little halo of things that aggregate around somebody who's got one or two characteristics that seem very good. He's handsome, he's a good talker. He must really be a good thinker as well. And so you get your professors and you know, what do they get paid for? Well, they get paid to be smart, right? And your pastor got paid to say whatever it was that the people wanted to hear him say, who are you going to believe? Well, of course, I'm going to believe the person who gets paid to be smart. And so the halo of having something really good to say, having something meaningful, having something that's probably insightful to say, kind of aggregates around the heads of the professors. I speak as a professor, right? So you can take 
everything that I'm saying and you can shake salt over it. That's fine. Um, polish your halo. Right. Yeah. Here. Right. But it, they get the credibility because they're good at some things and they really are good at those things. Let's hope uh, fine and good. But then it's like the old advertisement that I still remember from when I was a, a kid, some guy who was advertising some over the counter pain relief product or something he's, comes out. He, he played on some soap opera. He played a doctor and he came out wearing his lab coat and said, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. And, and of course, it, you know, immediately now as we dissect the commercial, we say, so why am I listening to your advice about something, medicine? What, what? So you're not a doctor, right? Okay, thank you. And uh, so, and, and it's a very adroit commercial. If you look it up, you can find it. But I think that there's a lot of that. You know, I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you how this piece of legislation will fire our economy. Says a Nobel Prize winning biologist. Like, what do you know about economics? Why am I listening to you about economics? Your halo doesn't extend that far. But we thoughtlessly fall into thinking that it does. So you get these kids. They go to college. They see very smart people. They really are genuinely smart and articulate and full of confidence, telling them bad philosophy. And they don't stop and say, wait, this is outside your field. You might be right, you might be wrong, but the fact that you're a, you know, a brilliant zoologist really does not qualify you to be talking about this any more than I am qualified to talk about this. So you stay there, I'll go start doing some investigation with people who have better qualifications in this and see whether there is unanimity among them and then you find out no, there is not. And then you've got to make some decisions and this is where it's very important you always keep that fundamental question in mind. If I am wrong, how will I find out? When should I change my mind? Mm -hmm. So I think the crisis of meaning has come upon us largely through bad philosophy masquerading as good biology, good physics, good what you will. And that bad philosophy has pulled the plug on transcendence and then left us like, like a guide who leads you out into the wilderness in the middle of the night and then it is gone in the morning. You're like, how did I even get here and how do I get back? And the solution to that is not more bad philosophy. It's not even more good science, good though science is in its own right. It's going back and fixing the bad philosophy with better philosophy, looking at the evidence that maybe we were distracted from and saying, it's time to reassess, where does this point? Is there really evidence that there is something transcendent? Because if there is, and I'm presently missing it, that's one of the most important things I could possibly be missing. It matters whether we get that one right. That, I think, is where the crisis of meaning really lies, and that's the root of it. That, I think that's a great place to wind up. And, um... I, I remember in one of your in one of your lectures you mentioned to the people listening that you could offer them some um, links to some PDFs of some of these older books that you found valuable. Yeah, I have uh, maybe forty or fifty of them right now up online, and I've got plans later this semester to try to increase that to several hundred. Uh, this is a website called Historical Apologetics, all one word: Historical Apologetics. Dot org. Okay. And it's the Library of Historical Apologetics. You want to go there and just search through it. I've got one sentence descriptions of many of the books so that you can tell whether it's the kind of thing you think you might want. I have links that go off site to places like the Internet Archive, Google Books, that you can click on where you can get a PDF copy. These are all in the public domain, so there's no copyright infringement with any of this. And uh, many of these books, again, they're old books. And even though occasionally there are things in them that I look at and I say, okay, well, I think that was a mistake. There are also often things I read there that make me say, wow, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? I've spent a lot of time reading this literature. I have now several thousand volumes of this on a hard drive. And looking at it, I have looked at some of these things and said, 
I was the son of a Bible college Greek professor. I took classes. I thought I knew this literature, and now I'm seeing there's so much here I never saw before. It is kind of mind-blowing and very humbling to discover that a field you thought you, yeah, I, I pretty much have a handle on the whole of that field. No, you don't. You don't even know 1% of what's out there. Whoa, that was well, so we need serious. To, we need to approach, when we read it, we need to approach it with an open mind and um, in a questing mind and yeah. always asking that question, if I'm wrong, how will I find out? That's it. And do you have a Twitter handle? I do not. I, I am a, as close to a Twitter ghost as it is possible to be. I am on Facebook. And uh, if people want to reach out to me, send me messages, you can send me a message without being my friend and I can still see it. So if anybody wants to reach out there, um, they can get me there. And uh, I'll, you I'll give, sorry? You have a website or a blog? The, 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 I don't blog, but the, uh, the historicalapologetics.org website does have a contact us feature as well. So if you want to send me an okay, email note, perfect. you can go through there. And uh, I'm, I'm always happy to engage with polite inquirers. So if your ecosystem is, has a rich set of them, that's great. The trolls I tend not to feed, but the people who really want information, whether they agree with me or not, are people worth interacting with. Yeah. Well, I think all my listeners are, are not trolls. So <laughs> Awesome. Wow. You are one blessed woman, Karen. I am. I am totally blessed in my listeners. So thank you so much, Dr. McGrew, for visiting with us today. And I, I hope we get to talk again sometime. Glad to do it. Just let me know if you want to do it again. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thanks, Karen.